You know, I'm so proud to live in a free country like America. We have freedom of speech, which obviously no other country has, freedom of the press, freedom of association, unlike those commie Russians. You know, it's really important, I think, that we defend our American values against those who would want to destroy them. There are so many out there. That is why, if you see someone using their freedom of speech to say anything against freedom, defined, of course, as anything outside of my personal Overton window, you need to immediately act. I mean, it's not just like they have different interpretations of what it means to be American, or that they want to make their country a better place, or they're just misguided in their efforts. No, 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 no. They actually hate America. They hate America. They hate Americans and our way of life. I know that they used to be your friends, your religious and social and political leaders, but they are now enemies of the state, I mean, of the, of the American people. They think that maybe a war that's cost tens of thousands of lives for no really terribly clear reason might be worth questioning? How dare they? They stand against our great patriotic war. They're in bed with the enemy. We shall send them to the walls. The penal battalions will send their families to the ca- Um, <laughs> um, r right, uh, <clears throat> that was, um, not entirely. <laughs> you are not immune to propaganda. Nobody is. Propaganda is often insidious. It is elusive, seductive in its approach, and deadly in its results. Individuals who fall prey to it often do so without even realizing it. They socially isolate themselves and hate that which is different or out of their understanding, and through that hate, they end up hurting not only their loved ones, but even the very causes which they claim to support. Unfortunately as well, propaganda can also be blatantly obvious, disturbingly so, and yet still, based on nothing more than anecdotal evidence and aesthetic taste, individuals will blindly accept it. Today I want to talk to you about one such disgusting example. An old anti-communist song from the 1960s by Marty Robbins called Ain't I Right. And I really hate to say that because it's Marty Robbins! Big Iron and all that! Great memories from wandering across the Mojave in Fallout! Uh, yeah, turns out the guy may have supported murdering American civilians because of thought crime! Yikes. Oh well, let's get started. The song begins with a lovely, cute little upbeat tune that makes you want to bounce up and down. Uh, yeah, then it gets bad. You came down to this southern town last summer to show the folks a brand new way of life But all you've shown the folks around here is trouble And you've only added misery to their strife Your concern is not to help the people And I'll say again, no, it's been often said Your concern is just to bring discomfort, my friend And your policy is just a little red Now ain't I right? Ain't I right? Right, so to get things started off, Robbins immediately moves to discredit any hint of possibility that the individuals he identifies as communists are anything other than outright mustache-twirling villains whose sole objective is to visit harm on the population. They are posed as outsiders coming down to a southern town. Also rather interesting that uh, this potentially frames this in sort of a no northern-southern perspective. Uh, and ever since their arrival in the town, they have done nothing but shown the folks, i.e. regular honest Americans, trouble and added nothing but misery to their lives, which are already difficult. Now the main calling cards of the socialistic and communistic movements is that of the working classes and the issues of wealth and labor inequality, for better or worse. Uh, Robbins immediately discounts this, however, saying that no, that purported cause is nothing but a front. Rather, their goal isn't, as they say, to help the people, it's only to bring discomfort. It's also worthy of note that while Robbins is talking in the song directly to a supposed communist, we never actually see a confirmation of that. He says to the northern stranger, your policy is just a little red. 
What exactly that means is never specified, however. Uh, yes, it could very well be the forceful redistribution of wealth and violent revolution. But if American politics tells us anything, it could also very well be something minor, like student loan or healthcare reform, like putting together a basic labor union. We're allowed to wonder at what that policy might just be. Every individual is allowed to fill in that role themselves as to what makes the person a communist. They fill in that blank of whatever they happen to feel is just a little red. In the first two stanzas, Robbins has established a foe which, despite coming from one's own country, seems foreign to the community. A foe which has no specifically outlined policies or beliefs, allowing us to imagine whatever we want. And a foe which has literally nothing but pain and suffering on their mind, like a comic book Nazi. This is followed up, of course, by the chorus, a dogmatic and repetitious insistence that the narrator, Robbins, is correct. Ain't I right, he asks, immediately followed up by a crowd asking the same, portraying this as a matter of down-to-earth common sense and not something that can really be questioned. Ain't I right? Ain't he right? Ain't I right? Ain't he right? The song continues. It matters not to you how people suffer, and should they you consider that a game? You bring a lot of trouble to the town and then you leave. That's part of your communistic game. I detect a little communism. I can see it in the things you do. Communism, socialism, call it what you like. There's very little difference in the two. Now ain't I right? Ain't I right? And now we have much the same repeated to drive home the initial points. It matters not to this stranger how the people suffer. Uh, indeed, that suffering doesn't even result from inability or from, from ignorance of good policy making or a misunderstanding of any kind. No, no, no. Rather, that suffering is the stranger's explicit goal. They consider it a gain. Their carpet-bagging game is now acknowledged by Robbins, though never by the actual subject. Uh, their input, as we'll see soon, is uh, totally irrelevant here, uh, to indeed be communistic. Robbins informs us that this individual is a communist, though not off of any actual revelation by the subject, nor with any actual evidence. Rather, Robbins feels, anecdotally, that it must be the case. He detects a uh, little communism and can see it in the actions of the individual. You see, an individual doesn't need to identify themselves as a communist. They don't even need to say anything close to it. If you think they are a communist, by whatever action uh, that may seem a, a little red, whatever that even supposed to mean, uh, well then, by golly, you have got yourself an enemy of America. And at that point, you need to shut yourself off from anything they may possibly say or believe or recommend, because as previously state stated, they only want to hurt you. There is no exception. Now, yes, this individual may make distinctions between the different forms of leftist ideologies, uh, socialism, democratic socialism, Stalinism, Lexism, uh, uh, Leninism, Marxism, uh, statism, syndicalism, and even, of course, just plain old so-called progressivism. Uh, yes, you can disagree with any or all of these ideologies, but to say that they're all basically the same thing is objectively wrong. It betrays an ignorance of those ideologies. As someone who's not a member of them, I see very clearly how immensely different they all are. To Robbins, however, the distinctions don't matter. Call it what you like, he says. It's all the same basic stuff. Communism, socialism, same thing. Sort of like how uh, monarchism and constitutional monarchism, dictatorship, oligarchy, and fascism are all literally the exact same thing with no distinction. Honestly, it's, it's, it's even dishonest, honestly, to say that National Socialism and Fascism are the same thing, let alone the insanely reductionist argument that Robbins is making here. And again, it's all based on nothing more than aesthetic 
preference, an appeal to emotion. He isn't providing an actual argument. All right, Robbins, you're, selling, you're saying to me that socialism and communism are exactly the same thing? Well, let's define these things and we can go through the histories, the, the major players in the movements, what they each call for in terms of political you know, reform and whatnot, and maybe we can make some comparisons, but no, we don't have any of that. Instead, we just have the old repetition, the chorus, ain't he right? Once again, before we continue. Your followers, sometimes have been a bearded, bathless bunch. There's even been a minister or two. A priest, a nun, a rabbi, and an educated man have listened and been taken in by you. All the country's full of two-faced politicians who encourage you with words that go like this. Burn your draft card if you like, it's good to disagree. That's a get acquainted communistic kiss. Now ain't I right? Now it comes time to address the supporters of this ethereal enemy. A bearded, hatless bunch uh, is nothing but an insult akin to a schoolyard bully, which addresses as, about as much as when uh, individuals will insult my voice when they dislike what it says. Uh, the strange implication, of course, being that uh, having a beard somehow makes one less moral, which has fascinating implications for things like the American Civil War. Uh, I'd also say very stupid implications. Uh, and of course, that wearing a, uh, wearing a hat somehow makes one more moral. It's an indicator of morality, which is uh, rather strange, particularly when you consider that a lot of commies were very clean-shaven and wore really big hats. But I suppose, you know, this isn't a real communist. He has a hat. We can, we can tell he's one of the good ones. Now, look, I love hats too, as much as the next guy, as you can see. And I really think that facial hair looks terrible on young people for the most part. Uh, but those are just part of my fashion sense, which is hardly uh, up to date, as you can see. Uh, and my fashion sense in no capacity is dictating my political beliefs, nor does it somehow prove me to be right or wrong, the fact that I shave every morning or the fact that I, I own a hat or two. Uh, so we'll chalk that up as yet another baseless emotional appeal to individuals who are just angry that not everybody agrees with their personal aesthetic preference. Uh, but still, who cares about a bunch of dirty old smelly hippies? Uh, now comes the truly dark attacks. Priests, nuns, rabbis, and educated individuals, your trusted social leaders, the representatives of your God and the teachers of your children, all of them have been corrupted. None can be trusted. They have been taken in by the communistic menace. These traditional sources of care and trust within a community have been corrupted if they betray even that minor hint of red. Instead, you must look to yourself and of course, to the likes of our savior, Marty Robbins. It is the classic mark of the cult of personality, of the abusive relationship. Cut off any and all previously trusted social ties, and in doing so, attach the individuals, their physical and mental well-being, to the abuser. They are communists. They want to hurt you. Now, ain't I right? And this is where things get uh, rather deeply totalitarian. When discounting the civic leaders, whom he calls two-faced politicians, he states that those who encourage peaceful protest against the Vietnam War are in fact pushing the population towards communism, applying that seductive communistic kiss. Indeed, there's also the strong implication that if you yourself don't want to go and fight in Vietnam, and, uh, and you burn your draft card, which is arguably a form of peaceful protest, uh, and that war being one of the most, you know, single most horrific conflicts which the United States has ever seen, uh, to say nothing of its often questioned morality, well, if you have any of those questions, if you have any doubts about going to war, and in fact, if you do do something like burn your draft card, well, then you might well be a communist. And then there's that line deriding individuals who supposedly say, it's good to disagree. Uh, the implication there, of course, being that, in fact, it is bad to disagree with your state. Now, for forgive me if I'm wrong about this, but I'm, I'm, I'm pretty 
pretty sure that disagreeing with one's own government and, and maybe even protesting its actions if you dare to do so, being a communist in that way, uh, in defense of things like personal liberties, uh, such as, I, I don't know, the liberty to not be sent against your will to a foreign war, that all seems pretty American to me. In fact, the only way that it could probably get more American, at least according to the experience of, say, the Founding Fathers, would be if those protests turned dramatically violent, that they didn't just burn their draft cards, maybe burn the local recruiting offices and whatnot. Maybe they could even take all those draft cards and, uh, and dump chests of them into a harbor in Boston or something like that. Uh, maybe they could start hoarding military supplies in open resistance for if the military comes to collect them, uh, and of course even going so far as to murder or torture individuals who try to enforce the state's laws. Huh. Imagine that. Moving on. One politician said it would be nice to send some blood and help the enemy in Vietnam. That's what he says, here's what I say, let's just keep the blood. Instead, let's send that politician man. Let's rid the country of the politicians. Who caught a tramp that march out in our street Protesting those who want to fight for freedom, my friend This kind of leader makes our country weak Now ain't I right? Ain't I right? Now, I must assume that this uh, politician, who's evidently calling for Americans to take up arms uh, or otherwise support the North Vietnamese, uh, if he did indeed exist, would have been commonly known to Robbins' audience. Though, still, keeping things vague is always in the advantage of the propagandist. You avoid the core facts that people could call you out on while still appealing to base emotion, making it seem like you have an argument where none truly exists. By not actually identifying the politician in question, it makes it much easier to potentially misrepresent their argument and twist the narrative into whatever you want it to say. Take, for example, nowadays, if, if a political candidate said something like, uh, well, obviously I decry Nazism, but at least Hitler put a tons of uh, animal rights policies in place, uh, that sort of thing may be in poor taste to say, but it's immensely far from an actual endorsement of National Socialism. Then, of course, from what is a potentially straw man argument uh, comes the canned and simplistic reply. It's a common one among those individuals with zero geopolitical knowledge and reminiscent of uh, we should pay all the soldiers the same wages as professional sports players uh, in its ignorance of how the world works. Robbins says that instead of applying military and political pressure in a particular way, which is supposedly being um, supported by that politician, instead we should just ship out the politician to fight his own war and die for it. Which actually is kind of funny, I think, because earlier in this song we have Robbins saying that those who don't want to fight in Vietnam are bearded communists. Well, then how about we keep the blood at home and we send you to fight the war, eh, eh Mr. Robbins? Then it gets really dark. Let's rid the country of the politicians. Now, yes, that could very easily mean voting them out of office. But again, the song is vague as to what exactly that ridding looks like. And with an upcoming line, you'll see just how disturbing it has the potential to be. Now, which politicians are we purging from the system? Well, of course, the ones who happen to disagree with you. After all, these politicians are calling you tramps. Again, vague. I'm curious what actual quote he's referring to there. Uh, who called who tramps? Uh, the president called you and your music fans tramps? Uh, a senator to another political party? Uh, heavens above, it could even be something like a local councilman who had an explosion one day, and here Robbins can, be, uh, can come in using that as an example to represent the entirety of an ethereal political elite, as if they were all one singular cohesive block plotting against America. Who knows who said the quote, who called who tramps, maybe it never even happened, and again we just have the anecdotal and the aesthetic. And then we have yet another insistence that if you dare to protest the war, to question the will of the state, then you must be anti-American. It's, it's a rather strange dynamic actually, because of course uh, presumably it was the politicians vague as that term is, who actually deployed the American troops abroad in the name of fighting communism. 
Robbins is taking a rather strange approach here of question the state and you're in bed with the commies, but also of how you can't trust the politicians, they're selling you out to the commies. So do we trust the state and support its war efforts absolutely no matter what? Or do we follow your instructions, Mr. Robbins, and rid the country of the politicians that we happen to disagree with? It seems a little difficult to do both, be a hardline statist and a rebel at the same time, um, because, uh, but because, of, again, of, of how vague the song is being, uh, on, on which politicians exact, exactly are the enemies and which ones are apparently uh, worthy of loyalty. Then, of course, as well, uh, that one line, those who want to fight for freedom, my friends, uh, is, is kind of a funny one. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of the boys over in Vietnam had a rather difficult time drawing the connection between uh, Southeast Asian geopolitics politics and uh, American constitutionalism. Uh, and of course, a lot of them didn't want to be there at all, uh, whatever the reason, uh, whether they were there for the right reasons or the wrong reason, they just didn't want to be there. Uh, finally, of course, that last line referring to those vague civic leaders as making the country weaker uh, bleeds very nicely into the final two stanzas. Uh, they're also the darkest ones by far, those upcoming, uh, making the obscure language of the rest of the song uh, really start to make sense as to how warped Robin's worldview seems to be. Let's look and find the strong and able leaders. It's time we found just how our neighbors stand. If we're to win this war with communism, let's fight it here as well as Vietnam. Let's rise as one and meet our obligations. So communistic boots will never trod across the fields of freedom that were given to us with the blessing of our great almighty God. Across the fields of freedom that were given to us with a blessing of our great Almighty God. These kinds of uh, leaders, whoever they may be, Again, Robbins is vague enough to uh, maintain his plausible deniability uh, in the instance of something going wrong, shall we say. Uh, those leaders, they are weak, and they are making the country weak. So let's look and find the strong and able leaders, evidently being those ones who are capable of towing the party line and those which don't question authority. And then, of course, the admission that this is not merely political talk. No, no, no. The war, just as it is being waged in Vietnam, is a domestic conflict, an internal struggle. You need to go out into your communities, Robin says, and root out communism's insidious tentacles wherever they may lie. Remember, you don't need any actual proof that someone is a communist. You can just see it in the things that people do, to use the singer's own words. So go out to your neighbors and find out where they stand. Fight the war at home, just as it is being waged in Vietnam. Because it is, Robin says, the exact same struggle. Robbins isn't outright saying, of course, to visit domestic terrorism on his fellow Americans, to establish kangaroo courts and lynch those who dare to appear just a little red. But this is a wonderfully vague song, isn't it? And why, if someone were to take inspiration from it to truly wage the domestic war against communism, meaning, of course, here, to, to be anything perceived as anti-American, uh, which in the 60s during the civil rights movement could be so deliciously broad to extremists, uh, well, you can hardly blame Robbins for their taking action, could you? He's only saying that you need to take action, you should take action, they're, they're taking over the world, take action right away! Oh, oh but you, you can't blame him if they actually do it, right? And then, of course, at the end of the song, we have Robbins' ultimate justification for whatever it is you might because, end up doing. Because, yes, you may have no firm legal or, or logical argument. Uh, it may be based entirely on aesthetic feeling and anecdotal evidence, but you must remember that Robbins has already discounted every civil, social, and religious authority that might be against you. They are, because they disagree with you, the enemy. They have already been seduced by the communistic Kiss.
No, no, Robin says to the extremists, you do not answer to these civic authorities, these social leaders, you answer to a higher power, the most vague, deliciously so, of them all. God. Remember, God is a very political figure. In Matthew 4.4, 4, when it was written that man shall not live by bread alone, the meaning that God was specifically involved in individual national histories was very clear. The Lord your God cares more for your physical well-being and your civic well-being in the form of American constitutional law than of silly things like faith or maintaining that faith no matter what the social structure looks like. Uh, no, 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 that is exactly why God led his glorious revolution against Rome and refused to give in to their unjust laws, of course. In any case, in any case, this specific land and its specific civil liberties were explicitly given to you by God. Uh, uh, yeah, the, the first people that he gave the land to, it was just, it was, it was a bit of a fluke. Don't, just, don't worry about them. Don't worry about them too much. Uh, now, as such, God, the great and almighty, is the only authority to which you are really responsible to, right? Now, communistic boots must never trod upon the free American soil, thus saith the Lord. And as such, your domestic struggle, your opinions, are divinely ordained. You cannot be wrong. You cannot be punished. You, the true full-blooded American, are the true arbiter of justice in this world. The communist is neither American nor evidently fully human, for God himself has cast his eyes away from them. So truly, while you may be punished by the weak politicians and even condemned by the corrupted priests, the nuns and the rabbis, and the educated men may scourge you your immorality, Remember that they too have fallen to the plague, a plague, thank the Lord, which you and Mr. Robbins, of course, have singly managed to avoid. Because you are perfect. You are divine. You are truly American. So you do what you think is best. Oh, but of course, again, Mr. Robbins, he's not asking for violence. That might be incriminating. Now, at the start of this video, you may have felt like my silly little intro bit was a tad much. That I was exaggerating, that surely the classic Western singer couldn't be that bad. Big Iron, it's fun, camp for the whole family. But I think that the deeper you look into the, uh, the lyrics of this song, uh, and when you place it into a social context in which statements like, the only good communist is a dead communist, were not just outright immediately and without thinking shunned as disgustingly anti-Christian, which they are, uh, anti-freedom of speech, which it very much is, and indeed I dare to say anti-American for at least one of the two former reasons. And again, to say nothing of the song's backdrop of race riots, and we're just coming off of the uh, tail end of McCarthyism, well, all of these things combined, and overall, I think we can safely say that this song is genuinely disturbing, genuinely disgusting. I am not a communist. I am not even a leftist. I would most readily identify myself as a one-nation conservative, and uh, usually I I'm pretty solidly centrist when it comes to many nations' politics, at least. Uh, though, if you look down a little bit deeper into the comment section down below, I am convinced by this point that you will be finding at least one or two self-righteous crusaders who have already proclaimed me to be at least a little red because they were able to see it in the things that I do. And now, of course, we know exactly where it leaves me in their eyes. Now, thankfully, those individuals who most often proclaim the need for violence in pursuit of political principles are more often than not cowards. I won't be losing any sleep tonight. Now, thank you all so very much for watching. Of course, particularly so to my ever-beneficent supporting classes on Patreon.com, for it is by virtue of their support that I am able to carry on with my work. And until the next time, my dear viewer, I am and I shall remain, I hope, your most humble and obedient of servants.
came down to this southern town last summer to show the folks a brand new way of life. But, you know, what is entirely unrelated to all of that is Brave, an internet browser unlike any other, which I'm not actually sponsored by, this is just my own sort of personal thing. Uh, while most of the internet is filled to the brim with, uh, with trackers and, and intrusive advertisements, imagine that, um, that interrupt your browsing, Brave is a faster, more efficient, and more private way to go. It blocks out all of those trackers, and so they never even reach your computer, saving you time and bandwidth. Uh, through the Brave Rewards program, you can even set the number of ads that you want to see. They appear as simple notifications in the corner of your screen and are far less intrusive than waiting for that skip ad button that you'll encounter here on YouTube. And the revenue from all of those advertisements that you choose to see and just sort of pop up in the corner every once in a while uh, is actually split between Brave, the actual browser, and your account as BAT coins. Uh, and you have uh, the option of then donating those coins to your favorite content creators uh, as a one-time or monthly donation. I actually found out if only a hundred people were to give me 10 bat coins per month, it would actually uh, double what I usually make in traditional advertisement every single month. It is that much better than the old system for you and the creator both. Uh, if you're interested in learning more, saving hours of your time, and taking better ownership of your online data, uh, then please consider using my referral link in the description down below to download Brave on your PC and mobile device, as I have already done uh, about a month ago, actually. Uh, to help drive the use of what I consider an exceptional service, I will actually be giving away half of all of my Brave creator income, both referral and bat coins, both uh, to charity, uh, which you can find out more about on my channel's community tab. Thank you all.